Uh, turning to Flora and uh, picking up on, on part of Lulama's presentation, uh, we see that um, although Africa is sometimes referred to as land abundant, in fact, the, the uh, amount of new suitable land is, is very concentrated geographically. Uh, and in most cases, uh, most countries in Africa, land is in fact very scarce. Uh, Malawi is an example, uh, perhaps the prime example, uh, along with Rwanda, um, of a land-constrained country, but M Malawi has this mix of farming scales. You have a large population of smallholders, uh, you have growing domestic medium-scale farms, as well as large-scale uh, commercial farming operations. Uh, is this a zero-sum game, where, where what, the growth of one size group is going to come at the expense of another? Uh, or, and is there a role for policy in shaping how Malawi's remaining land resources are allocated under the new agricultural policy, which is, uh, we expect soon to be adopted by government? Uh, thank you so much, Duncan, and uh, thank you for also giving me this opportunity to talk about Malawi. Uh, as uh, Duncan has said, um, in the Ministry of Agriculture, working in the uh, Department of Planning and Services, and I work um, uh, on a project called, which is uh, trying to make the policy environment suitable for agriculture. So currently, we are actually in the process of the developing the national agriculture policy. And uh, as he said, it's being, it's supposed to be um, vetted by the external holder, stakeholders at the end of this month or beginning of next month. And after that, it will hopefully become a policy for Malawi. So in terms of uh, land issues, when we were developing this policy, we had extensive consultations across the several districts in Malawi as well as at the national level. And one of the questions we were asking about land, we had a question on land asking the stakeholders and including the farmers, what should the national policy do with regard to this, uh, idle land? There's uh, evidence in Malawi that most of the estates that were active sometime in the 80s, 90s are currently not utilizing all the land that they were utilizing then. So what is happening is that you have idle land, but you have people around those estates, large estates, uh, who have very little pieces of land, which are less than two hectares, on average about 0.5 of a hectare. So uh, in most cases, these estates have actually been encroached on. Sometimes the owners have died and their children are not really farming the way they were supposed to be farming. So this uh, growing group of domestic medium scale farms is not a bad thing for Malawi because uh, if, if that is happening, it will actually be getting that idle land. And what we need is a policy, both the agriculture policy and the land policy that helps these medium scale farmers get access to the land that is idle. So we are still in the process of developing both policies. And at the moment, the policy is leaning towards identifying these medium scale farmers um, because most of them have the capital that is needed to invest in agriculture. Some of them, most of them are educated and they'll be able, for example, to adopt the technologies that need to be adopted. This doesn't necessarily mean that we are leaving out the small farmers as well. In the policy, we have, um, we are encouraging the small farmer to aggregate. So there's a, going to be a lot of cooperative development associations that help them to become, in their small scale, to become bigger if they aggregate with their neighbors. So we believe that it is not necessarily a zero-sum game at this point in time, but we need a policy on the land side that encourages um, a, a proper land market. Because if you are just grabbing it from the chiefs, if you know the chief and you can get that land, it's not necessarily the best way of doing it. But we want to have a policy that puts that uh, land on the market and makes everybody understand what the rules of the game are in accessing that land. And at the moment also some of the big programs, for example, irrigation programs that are being implemented, they will need to have land distributed from maybe small, uh, small farmers that are in the area where that irrigation project is being developed. And the farmers in that area will have to agree to either sell their land 
to the people that have um, been identified to, uh, to farm in those areas. For example, the sugar. In, in some part of Malawi, there is a sugar factory being built, and it will be surrounded by medium-scale farmers who have acquired maybe 10 hectares of land to farm on. But that land will have to be distributed from the farmers who are in that area, and they have to agree to sell it or to rent it to whoever is around the factory. So we believe that there will be, uh, the policy will be a big part of making sure that process happens uh, smoothly and that it happens in a manner that is equitable. That for the farmers that are completely left out, that there is, um, for example, we are trying to link the, um, the programs that are social protection programs, that if there are any people are left out in this redistribution of land, that they will be effectively linked to social protection programs. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Flora. And uh, I think it's going to be very valuable. Uh, I think Malawi's example is going to be very valuable in, in showing how an intentional approach to this issue of land allocation uh, can, can offer lessons for other countries. Uh, I'm going to come back to Flora, if, if David and Jean can be as efficient as Flora in expressing themselves. But I want to make sure that the time is allocated uh, equitably.